Hello everyone. My name is Dheeraj Lal and I welcome you to this business continuity podcast brought to you by Continuity and Resilience. I am today in conversation with the UK based Lyndon Bird who is chief knowledge officer for the US based DRI International and before that was for many years the international technical director of the BCI in the UK. Lyndon chairs the DRI Future Vision Committee and is the primary author of the annual DRI Resilience Trends and Forecast Reviews. Lyndon has spoken at and chaired conferences throughout the world and has contributed features, articles and interviews to most leading business and specialist publications. He has been interviewed by major broadcasters including the BBC, Sky News, Bloomberg TV and CNBC on a wide range of continuity and resilience topics. In this podcast, Lyndon gives us a quick insight into some issues that figure in the 6th annual DRI International Global Risk and Resilience Trends report. He mentions the critical role of social media where truth can do wonders and fake news can be used to intentionally deceive. Let's hear what Lyndon has to say. Lyndon Bird, welcome to BCM with Friends and thank you so much for being with us today. You are a stalwart. You've been in the industry a long time, validated by your BCI number which is member number eight. You helped found the Business Continuity Institute in 1998, and you were at that time influenced a lot by the DRI, which had already been founded a few years earlier in the US. You were a member of the original BS2599 Technical Committee, which helped write the first mainstream business continuity standard. You were elected chairman of the BCI in the year 2000, and the editor-in-chief of the BCI GPG, Good Practice Guidelines, in 2010 and 2013. For 13 years, you've edited and peer reviewed the professional publication, the Journal of Business Continuity Management and Emergency Planning. You were voted Consultant of the Year in 2002. And in 2004, you were awarded the BCM Lifetime Achievement by CIR Magazine. When you look back, I'm sure that's a great feeling. So just to start off, what brought you into business continuity and how's your journey been? Ah, well, thanks for asking that question, Dilash. Uh, it's a long journey, um, and I would like to say it all started through some great planning on my part, through some great insight, some strategic thinking about where the world was going. Right. But unfortunately, I have to tell you, it, it started through what happens to a lot of us on a lot of things, which is an accident, really. And that was 35 years ago this year. The first uh, few years were very difficult. Nobody knew what we were talking about. And even when they did, they didn't think it was something they had to spend money on. Um, eventually, we managed to put together groups of people. Before the Institute, there was a, an organization called Survive, which was set up by Andrew Hiles, who is someone I guess your listeners also know quite well. And Andrew had set up a, a user group, as he called it, for, for, for um, DR practitioners. So on that basis and working with Andrew and doing many other things, a number of us decided that we would try and form a professional body. And that was the um, BCI. We were quite influenced at that time by the DRI, which had already been formed several years before in the US. Um, I carried on with my own professional career, consultancy career for many years until eventually I got, got asked to join the, the, the BCI um, uh, in, in a, a management role, I became technical director, then international director, and then combined the roles. Did that for a number of years um, until the, the BCI, I think, was ready to move on to its next stage. Um, I decided that I was due to decide what I wanted to do in my life. Um, and then I got approached by good friends of mine that I've known for many years in the DRI to say, well, you know, we, we'd like you to be involved with us. And that's worked extremely well. I have a position there called the Chief Knowledge Officer, which essentially allows me to keep a, a good oversight on what's going on in our industry, what's going on in the profession, and where the DRI should be positioning itself in, in terms of that. And part of what I, I do in that context is, is produce you know, white papers, reports, analysis, um, on a periodic basis, together with a group of people that uh, uh, form what we call the Future Vision Committee. So that's a very potted history, but it, it's, it's 35 years uh, to move from uh, those early days of trying to work out what we actually were doing at all right. to um, where the, the industry is today, which is you know, a massive domain with lots of influence. So most, most uh, interesting journey, thank you. I think on behalf of the community, thank you so much because it's, it's a bunch of you who took that decision and what we see 35 years today later is 
a pure function of many of the good things that you and others have done. Uh, so I think on behalf of everyone, thanks a lot. By coincidence, we literally are talking on the day just after when you've released your sixth report for the DRI, the predictions report for 2021. Um, so could you just give us a sneak preview of what's in that? Okay, just one little um, comment on that is we actually release it in, in two parts. So the main part was released you see full trends and analysis of activities in the year and how we see the years gone. We have a small section which we really normally release in January, which is the actual 10 predictions for next year. That's a procedural thing we do. I know what they are, but they aren't actually in, in this report. If you read this report, you can probably guess a good idea of the areas and topics that we're going to be covering. So that, that's where we are. Yes, the report is the sixth. It's the most interesting so far. If you were involved in any sort of annual report, and throughout my career, I've had a number of these I've got involved with on a regular basis. And, and sometimes it can be challenging to find something that's totally different from any previous year that you, you feel you're, you're being originally, not sort of just going over the same ground. Um, this year, we didn't have any problem at all with that, of course. Um, this, this, surprise, year was, surprise. this year was like no other year. So. <laughs> Um, and I didn't really have to um, look around for issues or problems or, or challenges. But um, what it has done, of course, is given us a, um, a lot of insight into how people have thought about this year and about how they've um, not just the practical aspects of dealing with the COVID-19 situation, but the way they've thought about their role, their job, what they're there for, what they can actually contribute. And and I think it's challenged a lot of people in, in, in the sense of thinking, well, what is a resilience professional? You know, is it, is it someone that uh, essentially uh, goes in, writes some plans and administers them? Or is it somebody that actually really is at the heart of you know, saving our business, protecting our business, protecting our livelihoods? Which is what, of course, People like you, yourself and I have argued for many years that that's what it's about, but it, it actually brings it home to people. Um, and uh, I think this report has helped highlight that that very well. Um, in, in that we've you know we've we've challenged people in in terms of asking them their views. We, we, we've gone out to our, our certificate holders and other people who wish to contribute, as well as our expert panels, and said, well, you know, what are your views? Where do you think this is all going to go? What what is what's this? Been? And, and there's a, a number of issues that have come out which are um, pleasing. One, for example, which, which pleases me a lot is um, the, the uh, involvement of our community and the success of our community in the overall um, response to the, the set of uh, disasters, most of which you know, we had not conceived of at all in, in a unified form. And I... Uh, and I challenge anyone, although I, I, I know I'll get some takers who will disagree with me, but, but I would challenge anyone to really say they've got a proper um, plan for dealing with what we have experienced. Yes, we've got plans for how we can work from home. Yes, we've got plans for how we can uh, do a change and check it and manage our supply chains. In a different, we've got plans to do those, but putting everything together and knowing what we've got to do and how we do it particularly at the time when all the things we thought we could rely on were also stopped as well. I mean, this is quite an unbelievable challenge. And um, uh, and, and I guess all of us who have been consultants have uh, done a whole pile of exercises in, in their careers. And, can, uh, and I challenge anyone really to go along and say they could have actually gone along to one of their clients or, or in their own company if they were doing an internal project and, and said, we're going to do a scenario tomorrow where the Effectively, the business world ends overnight, <laughs> which is almost what happened in, in the, the start of this. Um, nobody would take you seriously. They'd say, well, go away and come back with something more sensible. Wouldn't right. they? Um, and, and yet we had to deal with that. We had to deal with immediately with no real. And I think our, our community did very well. I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying that the, the resilience community, the resilience domain professionals were the only people who did well. Obviously not. That would be ridiculous to say. But I think we contributed very well. I think we, we provide a lot of the glue that held a lot of the things that went together. We, we held the hand of the crisis management people who were not necessarily used to dealing with crisis about what could be done, what couldn't be done. Um, we, we brought an air of confidence that, that, that many of these things, which, which were new ideas to other people, weren't really that new. People who'd never worked from home, it was new to them, but we knew it could be done because we've done those sort of things. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I can go into a lot of detail about um, specific things, but but um, clearly, we, we all can you know can see the 
um, way that, that things have changed. And, and, and there is a lot of discussion in the report and, and there'll be a bit more in the predictions report about how this change is going to continue past COVID. But that's not really what I was thinking of here. I was really thinking of working from home be the norm, as some people have suggested. Will cities, large mega cities sort of turn backwards and, 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 and not continue the growth they've been seeing over the past three, four decades? Mm -hmm. um, you know, will business travel you know, be a thing of the past? Will, will video conferencing take over every aspect? Will all the airlines go to business because of that? Um, will the hospitality sectors ever, you know, ever recover fully from the situation? Um, so where, where I differ with some of my colleagues and, and, and peers is that I'm not so convinced about the ability of um, people to change their basic um, mentality sets. I don't think that people um, who want to work from home will have worked from home anyway if they could have done they may work a bit more now. People who don't want to work from home but are forced into working from home because that's a corporate ideal that they think they can run that more smoothly will actually vote with their feet, as we, we like to say over here, and, and, and move you know, and move to where they will find the solution they want. And some, some organisations will realise that um, close connection of people, building teams, building relationships, building corporate cultures are much more important perhaps than some efficiency is just an operational matter. So I think we've got a lot of questions that we, we might want to sort of challenge for the future. And some of those are picked up in the report. In terms of social media within the report, um, clearly social media is, is all pervasive about uh, a whole world today. And, and therefore, um, we, we, we look at social media uh, from a positive and a negative side in, in terms of uh, our business continuity profession certainly um, uh, it, it can provide um, methods of getting messages over communicating well getting involvement at the same time of course it can um, create big problems by by our fa by the term that's been made very famous over the last four years fake news and the problem with, with any aspect of social media is even when it's extremely entertaining it's very uh, very difficult to tell whether what you're reading, what you're trying to, to comprehend is actually truth, which is valuable, sort of vaguely truth, which provided you interpret it a bit, you can use um, a nice story, but it's largely fantasy or something that is deliberately designed to be untrue to get you to make the wrong decisions. And when you're in that territory and when you're trying to use that as a source of decision taking or communicating both ways, in a crisis situation, then it is um, uh, you know, it's clearly a, a, an area there of, of potential for mass escalation of, of difficulties. There's very little, uh, there are very few problems social media can't make worse if it wishes to, yeah. and there's very few they can't actually have a positive help on if it was used properly. Absolutely. From a social media perspective, what do professionals need to look out for? interesting times and all I can think is that any regulation of any big boys just mean there'll be smaller non-regulated boys find different ways of doing it as as we've seen in in this so it's an interesting interesting I have no solutions I guess no one has solutions but the one thing is certain there are it's not going away it's it's very nice to have the opportunity to think about them and talk about them and discuss them with fellow professionals do you feel that things have been propelled towards organization resilience and how would you uh, figure out uh, how the business country profession actually takes things to the next level. Ah, yeah, this is interesting. Um, six months ago, I, I, I wrote in, in a piece, I wrote um, for, for one of the, the journals I, I contribute to, um, about the, the challenge that, that this was going to bring. Would, would how we dealt with this particular crisis lead to almost... Um, vindication of what we've been saying for a very long time or actually almost the reverse w would we as a as a domain as a profession discipline whatever we wish to call ourselves you know, we we deal with that would we revert to being some sort of um, administrative compliance officers of a particular risk or would we actually be able to move our, our, our subject forward now We've done a lot in trying to move it forward with the development of the, the idea of resilience management and, and moving away from continuity. 
Um, although I've, I've had my reservations about um, some of those aspects, which I think is, to some extent has been rebadging rather than, um, than, than restructuring ideas. But that, that's, you know, that, that's a moot point. Um, and um, so I would say I think we've come out of it so far. Our professionals come out of it. I think it's come out of it with an improved reputation. I think it'll get uh, more attention at higher levels in organisations. That should lead to more senior positions. That should mean, lead to um, roles such as, you know, which I've long promoted the idea of sort of a chief resilience officer to incorporate and bring a whole pile of disciplines together and things that are outside. One of the things we look at in our surveys is the bandwidth really that a typical um, resilience professional today has and what is not in, in there. And you often find, surprisingly, there are a lot of areas that, that uh, you would think they'd have more involvement in the, than, than they do, even, even cyber to some extent, which is a critical you know, risk issue of our age and a technology one, which is where we normally strong. Um, often, you know, the people are saying, well, it, it's longly handled, bit mainly by specialists and we only get in a bit at the at the edges other things like financial crisis which um we maybe not be in the position to manage the financial crisis but we are in there to manage the mitigation of the results of it often is not not in there as much as you'd expect yes of course part of it operational faults it failures fire floods and the all all the normal things that happen terrorism. yes we're banging of that but there are the, the, these areas outside regulatory failures and issues like that which which can bring a business down but but our professionals are not always i think we're going to spread that way i think we're going to become broader i think we're going to pick up a wider range of risk portfolio that we've got some sort of solutions to i think we're going to get um probably a centralized focus at board level such as a, a chief resilience office or some such title we're going to bring together what we saw as continuity risk security health and safety, wide range of other things, perhaps into, into a portfolio in the future. Um, I think that's going to happen now. I, I, I have no, no doubt that this has been the trigger to show that it's necessary. Uh, as you and I have, have chatted over occasions, I know, and I've always said to you, one of the biggest problems we had at the beginning was getting anybody to believe anything would ever go wrong. And, 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 and we, we don't have that problem anymore now. Everybody knows that things can go wrong. Perhaps the biggest problem we'll have in the future is getting anyone to believe anything will go right. I think we perhaps need um, more skills in our teams because we haven't all, we aren't all experts. Okay. You may, you ask me questions about economics, I can give you a comment, but I'm not an economist. Maybe we need people with better skills in there. Maybe we need people with better skills in others, in our wider teams. But, you know, I think, I think the understanding there that this is, this is not just a department that writes things down, which will never happen and just, just, keeps the regulators happy i think that's gone for good well i hope it's gone for good and uh, so i think our, our future is bright in that area that is a, that is a finish with a statement of philosophy then shall we <laughs> that's a great note to finish on Lyndon. brilliant fascinating and uh...